Welcome to State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. I'm the producer and host today, Deborah Sloss, licensed marriage and family therapist, and my pronouns are she, her. Last month, we released an episode that was about the important role reproductive freedom plays in achieving good mental health. In that show, one of the women talked about experiencing serious postpartum depression during one of her pregnancies. As a follow-up, today we're going to be discussing postpartum or perinatal depression, PPD, which is also now often being called perinatal mood and anxiety disorders in order to include the symptom of anxiety, which is common to the condition. We'll be using these two terms interchangeably in this interview. Postpartum depression is a mood disorder that can affect women after childbirth and includes feelings of extreme sadness, anxiety, and exhaustion that may make it difficult for them to effectively care for themselves and their babies. Fathers and partners may also experience postpartum distress. This condition is often underrecognized and underdiagnosed, as you will hear from our In Your Voice story contributor later in the show. Postpartum depression can occur any time in the first year postpartum, sometimes with an onset unexpectedly several months after birth or the adoption of a new baby. Without treatment, postpartum depression can last for months or even years. While this interview was originally conducted back in 2020, for today's show, we've remixed it and added Brittany's personal story about her experience with postpartum depression. In the interview, I'm joined by Laura Valsette, who shares her experience with postpartum depression and anxiety following the birth of her twins. Also with us is psychotherapist and lactation consultant, Maggie Muir, who helps us understand what postpartum depression is, who's at risk, and how and where to get help and support. Let me tell you more about these guests. Laura Valsette and her husband came to the United States in 2006. He's from Norway and she's from the United Kingdom. They spent two years on the East Coast of the U.S. while Laura was attempting to finish her doctorate in English literature. In the end, she decided she didn't want to be an academic and gave it up to pursue art and other things. The couple moved briefly to Vancouver and then to Santa Cruz, California. Before she had her children, she was a freelance illustrator and graphic designer. Now she combines that work with flower farming and floral design. Laura had her twins in January of 2012, and her journey through perinatal mood and anxiety disorder began when they were about five to six months old. Maggie Muir is a licensed psychotherapist and board-certified lactation consultant. She's a mother and grandmother and has devoted her career to supporting family wellness through the childbearing years. Maggie led the Perinatal Mental Health Coalition of Santa Cruz County from 2014 to 2018 and has led trainings locally and nationally on perinatal mental health and the intersection of maternal mental health and breastfeeding. Maggie founded the Postpartum Wellness Support Group, which has been running in Santa Cruz, California since 2005. She finds it a great joy and privilege to support families through birth and postpartum and is passionate about postpartum wellness. Welcome Maggie and Laura to State of Mind. So it sounds like a really big subject and um, as you could hear, I was struggling a little bit with the, the name because it's now called Perinatal Mood and Anxiety Disorders or PMAD. And can you tell us a little bit about what that is and who is affected by it? Uh, I, will, I will explain the names um, in just a moment, but to put postpartum depression and anxiety in context, the perinatal period, pregnancy and postpartum, is the most vulnerable time in a woman's lifespan. And it is the time most vulnerable for the emergence or recurrence of a mental health disorder. Having a baby can be a wonderful and miraculous time. It can also be a perfect storm for a mother's well-being and mental health. A new mom is healing from birth, caring for her baby around the clock. Her sleep is disrupted. Her hormones are in dramatic flux. We know hormones affect brain chemistry. And whether this is her first baby or her fifth, whether she's just given birth or just adopted a baby, this is a profound time of adjustment for a family 
and this mom, baby, and family need great care and support. So there's a whole spectrum of mood disorders that can occur during pregnancy and postpartum. We used to commonly refer to postpartum depression, and now we know there's just this broader um, understanding of what can happen for a new mom. Are they also referring to the period during pregnancy and changing yeah. the name? Yes, okay. yes, because perinatal refers to pregnancy and right. postpartum, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, mood and anxiety disorders, that sort of is you know, to catch all of the anxiety symptoms that are really common postpartum, pre during pregnancy and postpartum. So if we look at the spectrum, there's, we can start with the baby blues, which actually aren't a disorder. This is a normal occurrence. About 80% of new moms will experience the blues. It's a transient emotional, a time of emotional tenderness or tearfulness, irritability in the first two to three weeks postpartum. This typically resolves with rest and care. So when you say 80%. That this is just normal. Yeah. Like you, you can, if, if you have a friend that's having a baby or you're having a baby, you can expect that you're going to be teary the first days and weeks. You're going to look down at your baby and just start to cry because she's so beautiful. You know, you might catch the, the long-distance telephone ad on TV and find yourself weeping. It's just a very tender time. I see. And Mother Nature wants a new mom to be in a state of heightened sensitivity, to bond with and attune to her new baby. So this makes sense evolutionarily. Um, Beyond these blues, which are normal, postpartum depression and anxiety are also common and can occur, as you said, any time during the first year of postpartum. Untreated, it can continue on into the second or third year of a child's life, and we then refer to that as maternal depression. Um, so common symptoms of postpartum depression would be crying and sadness, irritability, sleep disturbance, often feelings of guilt, shame, and hopelessness loss of pleasure and things she used to enjoy, and concerns, frequently concerns about bonding with her baby. Common symptoms of postpartum anxiety include excessive worry, sometimes panic, often insomnia. So this is a mom who can't fall asleep even after her baby does. And just imagine, you know, you're a new mom, you finally get your precious baby to sleep, and then you're lying awake having anxiety. And you know your baby's going to be awake again in two hours. So this can become a really vicious cycle. And we know that sleep deprivation can exacerbate anxiety. In the postpartum wellness group, we often say that Mother Nature selected for a new mom to be hypervigilant. Um, again, evolutionarily, Mom is responsible for the most vulnerable member of the family, her tiny helpless baby, so we want her paying attention. In the group, we also talk about the fact that fear comes with love. And when you fall in love with your tiny, fragile baby, you, it's natural to worry about anything happening. To wrap this up, it's normal to be in a state of heightened sensitivity as a new mom. If you're crying more than your baby and feeling hopeless and guilty, you need prompt care. These are symptoms of depression. And likewise, worrying about your new baby is normal. Being incapacitated by anxiety and panic isn't, and so we need to help you find resources to calm your nervous system. Yeah, you were saying that 80% mm -hmm. of people get typical blues, that that's mm -hmm. just part of it. But of that, you know, what actual group actually develops what you'd consider perinatal mood and anxiety disorder, and how does one know the difference? Perinatal mood and anxiety disorders is just a catch-all sort of umbrella mm -hmm. for what can happen mm -hmm. during pregnancy and postpartum. And how you know the difference is, so the baby blues are transient, they happen early. You know, if a mom's three or four months postpartum, if she's having trouble getting out of bed, feeling really debilitated, we know that's not the baby blues. Okay. So, because, um, and, and the baby blues tend to be early and kind of transient. You know, perinatal depression and anxiety doesn't discriminate. Cuts through all racial and ethnic categories, socioeconomic, sexual orientation, etc. In all your work with new moms, do you see that people who um, experience this do they does it get better for them? Absolutely, absolutely. Depression and anxiety are treatable, and all of these mood disorders have the potential to be temporary and 
you know, resolve with care. And we're going to talk more about what kind of care in a little while. Yes, we'll get into that. Yeah, we'll get into that. Laura, thank you so much for graciously coming in You're and very welcome. to share your story. Happy to. Yeah, so you had experience with postpartum depression, mm -hmm. and you were willing to come in and tell us something about how this happened in your life. Definitely. So, uh, as you mentioned, my kids were born in 2012. We... Um, we did have fertility treatment in order to get pregnant, which I'm sure Maggie can talk about, but it does put you in a higher risk category for what I tend to refer to as uh, PPD. Um, PPD. Postpartum depression. And I often miss off the anxiety too, just because it's easier to say. Mm -hmm. um, so everything was fine. Uh, pregnancy went well. Had a lot of sickness, but that was okay. C-section was fine. Um, and then about three months after the birth, my milk supply fell away. So, you know, I tried a bunch of different things. There was probably some hormonal upheaval going on at the time too. And I stopped breastfeeding. Looking back, that may have been a contributory factor. Who knows, really? Um, and then a few weeks after that, I started to feel very homesick. And I get bouts of homesickness from time to time, missing my parents and my family in the UK. I should mention as well that my mum and dad were here for the birth, and then they went home about, I think, I think three weeks, four weeks postpartum. I suddenly started feeling oddly homesick and I couldn't shake it. And I started to just feel a bit crummy and a bit low. And so I talked to uh, my husband, Einar, who's been wonderful, and he suggested I talk to my OB. So I went to my OB and talked to her. And she said, oh, I think you might have uh, a light case of postpartum depression. Um, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll set you up with a therapy appointment um, and see where that goes. And sent me home. And it was at that point, I think, I think unconsciously I'd been probably like holding on, thinking that I'm sure when I see the OB, she'll say, there's nothing to worry about. And maybe she'll give me some kind of pill or vitamin and she'll send me home and it will all be fine. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she said that, the floodgates opened. So I went home and that night, I remember, my husband remembers it so clearly, so do I. He made me Dungeness crab with mayonnaise and bread. It's one of my favourites. And I just sat there and stared at it. And he said, you know, you're not hungry? And I was like, I can't eat. I cannot eat. Mm. I'm so sorry. I can't eat this. Um... And immediately alarm bells started to ring. And we were like, what? This is very odd. I, I like my food. It takes a lot to put me off my food. Mm -hmm. And so I was just bemused and I started to feel very upset. The anxiety really started to take hold. I started to feel like you do before you're going into an exam, you know, all the time. I just um, have to say, since our listeners can't see, you have your fists clenched. <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah, as yes. if you're, you know, wrapped in a vice or something. Definitely. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, called mum and dad on Skype, and we were talking, and my dad said, so, you know, he'd been prompted by a and I think, and went, how are you feeling? And I immediately just went, oh, I'm so terrible. I'm so, I was like, I can't do it. And he said, do you want us to come back and stay? Yes, please. And then within like, oh, I don't know, within a week, they took a horrible selection of like flights to get here and they were back and they stayed for another three months. So they were lifesavers, yeah. as was my husband. So that's just having that support come in. Oh, just mm -hmm. knowing they were on their way mm -hmm. even yeah. was so much better. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so would you say one of the principal feelings was overwhelm? Like Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. I do remember my kids when anything new would happen, like, you know, because the stages seem, what do they say, the years, the days seem long and the years are short. Mm -hmm. And it did feel like I was in this, this was going to be my life forever, mm -hmm. taking care of small babies who needed me all the time. And I mean, it was, and it was two at once, so it was pretty mm -hmm. relentless. Just every time they developed a new habit or their nap schedules changed, or I mean, even later when they started to eat, you know, solid food, I was like, oh no, I can't cope with this. I just found an equilibrium. Can we pause for a bit? And of course, babies don't <laughs> pause. They just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, yes, there was definitely that feeling of like, I can't, I can't keep up with this. I can't cope. And I mean, just like he was saying, Maggie, not being able to sleep when the babies sleep, that began yes. as well. And that would mean that I, 
you know, we'd do the feedings and stuff. And as it got to sort of the five, six month mark, I guess I would be waking up at two and staying awake until six when the babies woke up and then that would be it. Wow. And I would be so tired, Yeah, you know, but anxious as well. So I couldn't sleep. So you were saying that you called your OB at about three or four yes. weeks? Yes, uh, three or four months. Three or four months, yeah. okay. And then between, you know, now you're jumping to five and six months. So yeah. did you get some help? I did. So at the, th- at the three or f- at the f- like four month mark, OB sent me home, we'll make you a therapy appointment. Then I sort of fell off this cliff yeah. instantly within like 48 hours. Yeah. And I think we called you, Maggie. I can't remember. Qu- I, my memory mm-hmm. is also very hazy about, for all the reasons, mm-hmm. babies, PPD, the whole, re- you know, so my timeline is a bit messed up. But I'm pretty sure we called Maggie. Um, and one of the things I think you said was, you know, call your doctor again, because this is now urgent, and then you're gonna call me back and let me know you've made that call. So it also held me accountable, like Mm. I had to do something. And then my husband was making sure I did all these things and you know. So that happened, called Maggie, called my doctor again, got in really quickly to see a therapist, uh, Janine Layton, who is amazing and she's a specialist in perinatal uh, mood disorders. So we went in for an appointment with her um, and then uh, concurrently, I also had an appointment with a wonderful nurse practitioner um, who set me up with meds. So we did it all at once. It was very quick, very prompt. I'm profoundly grateful to, for being part of this community that has all these resources, and they were just instantly deployed. It was like just throw everything at it, <laughs> which is honestly, I think, the way you need to do it. There's no point sidling up to treating this thing. Just throw everything at it. Why is it so important to treat it quickly? Well, it's really important because mom is suffering and her family's suffering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a mom can really spiral into crisis if you're not sleeping. Mm -hmm. A couple of days without sleep can really set you up for a mental health crisis. Uh, For a mom with a history of bipolar disorder, a mom can have a psychotic break if she goes a couple of nights without sleep. You know, it's just, also, it's just really important that we get a mom Mm -hmm. get help and relief so Mm -hmm. that she can enjoy this time with her babies. Mm-hmm. Would you say as well that it takes the longer you leave it, the longer it takes to heal or can take? Thank you, Laura. Yes. Prompt treatment mm. is the most helpful, and the sooner you get help, the easier it is to recover. Right. This mm. is true with any illness. Mm. You know, it's like we don't want symptomatology to get really entrenched. We don't want things to really progress to mm. the point where it's kind of chronic. Yes, where it's chronic. Mm. One of the things I noticed with m- my experience with it was that it's Dis, even with early and very effective treatment, it's very easily easy for those symptoms to become chronic in a way that makes them appear like they're your new normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and luckily, because I was in treatment and my whole family was aware of it, they were able to tell me that these were symptoms and not, Laura's just a terrible mother and that's just the way it is. Oh, that was the meaning that you were making? Yes. Mm -hmm. I would, I don't know, your brain, my husband used to say to me, your brain just hates you right now. Mm -hmm. It, it's not, it's not telling you the truth. Yes. You know, it's making up the, the symptom of this illness is that you're, you will tell yourself stories about yourself, what you're like as a mother, why you're destined not to be a good mother, that you'll never be any better than this it will couch those feelings and those anxieties in different packets and just throw them at you one after the other. So you might quash one and then the next one will surface and that'll need quashing as well. So I had things like, well, because I'm an only child, I would have thoughts like, well, I'm an only child and now I've got twins. I'm just not genetically, I'm not, I'm not set up for this, for my experience. Um, I'm too selfish to be a mum, clearly. Um, I'm just not strong enough. You know, all these different, all these different things. Um, my mom was such a great mom. I'm never going to be as good as she was. And I remember my husband having to, and this was in the early stages when we just had started therapy and meds. All the symptoms kind of 
come came to the surface. So there was a period of me feeling really awful, despite the fact that I was in treatment. It just had to come out. And my husband would sit with me and he'd be there at 2 a.m. God love him, he was amazing. And uh, he would just sit and he would hold me while I sobbed for like an hour or two. Hmm. And I would tell him what I was thinking and he would reiterate to me again and again, this is not the truth, this is just something your brain is telling you, this is a symptom of your condition. This is not you as a mother. This is not reality. Right, or who you are. Or who I am. But Mm -hmm. I had to have him say that. Without that perspective, it would have been incredibly hard to do that continuous marathon mental... Right, to get out from under those messages that you were hearing. Yes, because they're they're continuous. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the, you know, part of the symptoms, which was for me anyway. You're describing this in such a clear way for all of our listeners. It's so confusing. Mm. You expect to be exhausted as a new mom. You expect that your sleep will be disrupted. And you Mm. had two beautiful babies to take care of. Mm -hmm. But then when you kind of slip into that cycle of anxiety where you can't slip and Mm. and depression can really distort your thinking. Mm. So instead Mm -hmm. of recognizing I am really depleted, I'm really depressed, the the message is I'm a bad mom. I can't do this. That's Mm. right. And that, and it's so wonderful that your husband was able to meet you right there and Mm. challenge that thinking. That was really insightful of him, too, not to get seduced by those messages, too, because they're relentless, right? It sounds like when you were describing them. This is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. In case you're just joining us, I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm talking with guests Laura Vossett and psychotherapist and lactation consultant Maggie Muir about what has traditionally been called postpartum or postnatal depression and is now being known as perinatal mood and anxiety disorders or PMAD, PMAD. We're also hearing from a community member who sent us her personal story. Back to our interview. Uh, Maggie, you were just getting ready to respond to some things that Laura had said. Oh, I wanted to ask you, Laura, Hmm. did Anar come with you to counseling sessions? He did. I think he may have come come with me to the first one, Mm -hmm. I think. Great. Um, just so that he could get a handle on it. It can you know? be so helpful for partners to get some guidance. Yeah, and my husband, I think, I think like quite a lot of partners, he's, he's a solver. He sure. likes to fix things. Um, and I think Janine, my therapist, said, you know, when you go home, make sure she has small pieces of protein and dairy, like cheese, ham, something like that in the fridge that she doesn't, because she doesn't want to eat. So you have to make it super easy for her to get something. Just like in every every hour, I'd go and have a handful of it. And he bought, um, I think, Ensure to make sh- and stood over me while I drank it. Initially. The liquid protein yes. drinks you're talking about, uh huh? Yeah, because mm-hmm. he because I wouldn't actually eat anything. I just couldn't face it. And he's like, "Well, I'll get you this. You you've got to drink it." And he would stand over me while I drank it, and then he would feel all right that I'd actually consumed something. And then when I started to be able to eat again, he would get me small pieces of protein. But that giving him like it helped him as well as me I think mm-hmm. having practical steps to take to help the situation to help the situation mm-hmm. yes. you know that was okay we can you know we can get our way through this yeah. but I do remember walking to Janine's office and um, it was just it was, it was just like tears wall to wall sobbing and mm. I think she's probably seen this many times before so I didn't phase her but I was just a complete blubbery mess and um, I remember she said to me, just like you did earlier, Maggie, she's like, this, you know, this isn't forever. This, this is an illness and it will go away. And for some reason, I was just so relieved by that because mm-hmm. I think I'd convinced myself that this was it, you know. Um, it was just, I was going to be left like this. At some point, I was never going to be whole again. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to hear that it would eventually go away was great. And also, um, in terms of the timing, I know I mentioned that I'd been warned, we'd been warned about postpartum. Why were you warned? I think largely because we were in the risk group with having had fertility treatment that 
and, and multiple babies as well. So there were two risk factors, multiple babies at once and the IVF puts you in a risk group. So oh, they okay. just gave us a gentle, you know, keep an eye out. But one of the things they said, be particularly aware of this in the first three months. And so we were on the lookout for it for the first three months. And then we were like, oh, done, you know, mm -hmm. made it out from under the wire. Don't need to worry about that anymore in the first three months. So when it hit later on, it sort of caught us on the back foot, mm -hmm. you know, but we, we very quickly got in line with it. But it was it was a shock, even though we'd been sort of prepared for it. And it was nice talking to Janine again when I walked in for that first appointment because I said, well, it's, you know, it's, but I'm, it's, it's five or six months down the line. This is just who I am as a mother. It's been half a year. And she went, no, that's classic. That is very, very typical. Mm -hmm. And again, I was like, no, really? That's, an, that's, that's an, oh, okay. Because the, the last thing you want to hear when you walk into a doctor's office is, oh, this is very unusual. Right. You know, right. Let's get the students <clears throat> in. You're a, right. you know, a one and only case. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but when she was like, nah, you're just, you're just run of the mill. I was like, oh, thank you for that. <laughs> that was you. great. And if I may add, we see, you know, perinatal depression can happen, can occur any time in the first year postpartum. Mm. Often it's three or four months out that mm. it begins. And if we think about this in a practical way, at that point, a lot of the help has fallen away and the exhaustion and the mm -hmm. sleep disruption has really caught up with yeah. you. And it's also very common that you had some breastfeeding challenges and had stopped breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Understandably, um, it, can, it can get challenging with yeah. the, the situations you were describing. And breastfeeding can be protective. It has, you know, Mother Nature, again, has a plan. The hormones of breastfeeding are calming. And so sometimes if a mother after she's weaned her babies mm -hmm. will go into a dip of depression and sometimes mothers will think oh breastfeeding is the problem it's it's exhausting me mm -hmm. and they'll stop breastfeeding and then they'll dip because they've lost some of the protection of those hormones mm -hmm. so. I want to come back to something because it went by very quickly mm -hmm. but I think you mentioned that when you went in that that next time to see your OB and you were you know serious about something is mm -hmm. very wrong um, that you said you were quickly put on meds. And I wanted yes. to just check that with you. Mm, Is that what you said? It was, okay. yes. It was both at the same time, okay. pretty much. Okay, so I want to turn to Maggie on that and ask, is that common a common part of the treatment? And I think um, many people might have reservations. Can you share some information about sure. the role that meds play in, in helping with postpartum depression? Sure, I'm happy to. Meds can be a lifesaver. So. So for a serious depression, like you're describing, mm -hmm. Laura, it can really lift a mom up and, and help her recover. Um, probably the gold standard would be meds and counseling. What's helpful for, for listeners to know is that there are a lot of medications that are safe to take when breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, occasionally a mom needs medications that aren't safe to take while breastfeeding, some of the antipsychotics used for bipolar depression aren't compatible with breastfeeding. And in that case, the most important thing um, that a baby needs is a healthy mom, and that a mom needs is effective treatment. Mm -hmm. So the, the most important thing is that mom's health. And what we like to tell a mom who does need to wean is that every time she feeds her baby the bottle, she's feeding her baby with love. So you just picture that mama wrapping her arms around her baby, feeding her baby with love, mm -hmm. and knowing that taking care of herself mm -hmm. and getting effective treatment is everything. But just yeah. to clarify, there are many meds that can be taken, uh, medications, yes. it sounds like, yes. while breastfeeding that are safe. Mm -hmm. Yes, and most of the you know, antidepressants are compatible with mm -hmm. breastfeeding. If a mom, and she can get a prescription from her midwife, her OB, mm -hmm. some uh, primary care provider, sometimes she'll be referred to a psychiatrist, or I think you saw Kathy Johnson. I did, yeah, yeah. A psychiatric nurse. Yeah. Psychiatric nurse practitioner. Lovely. She's a, another wonderful resource in town. We, I should also mention that just, um, by the by, it can be useful for both partners and patients to be aware that not everyone in the medical profession is quite as forward thinking. Because I do have friends who've gone in and have been told explicitly, no, we know you're depressed, but we can't give you anything because you're breastfeeding. Yes. And so, just sent them away. So you really want to see someone who's savvy about... You, yes. It's get, once you reach the right group of people... They'll, they'll know. Such a good point you brought up, Laura. Unfortunately, we are making progress in this area with information. And I think certainly an OB care provider, a midwife or OB, is a good starting place because they're very familiar mm. with these concerns. 
Okay. And other than that, just find somebody who has specialized training in perinatal care. Okay. Is there a um, like a organization or anything that people could call to find local providers in their area who have that expertise? You know, we have one of the resources listed. Our, our local perinatal mental health coalition has a website. It's speakupsantacruz.org. We don't yet have care providers or practitioners listed, but I think that's something that we've talked about doing mm -hmm. is having a sort of a database of practitioners who have specialized training mm -hmm. in treating mm -hmm. perinatal mood disorders. So um, we were talking a little while ago about, just a little bit about meds, mm -hmm. medications, and I am curious, did you have any reservations yourself? Because I find that people just for all kinds of reasons have reservations about using medications. At the time, I think I was so desperate that no. As long as they were okay, potentially if I was still breastfeeding a little, um, then no. I think I did worry that they would change me, turn me into someone else. Was that your experience? No, definitely not. What was your experience? What benefit did you get from medications, if any? Um, so it did, did take a while which was another reason why it was great to have support, because they can tell you, this will take a while, here's what to expect from the process. So that was good. Um, and that event, that, that worked. It did take some time to, to bed in. Um, I think what I noticed first was intermittently a slight lifting of this cloud. It's like you're walking around under a big cloud or with a big weight. Um, and I would, it would suddenly feel like I'd breathed out. And there was this, oh, oh, everything's not so bad. And I'd be able to look at the kids and enjoy what they were doing. You know, because there's also this awful guilt when they're this little and everyone says, oh, this must be the happiest time in your life. And, you know, aren't you enjoying every moment? And you're like, no, <laughs> it's, it's horrible. Um, so actually being able to look at the kids and enjoy them made me feel good because I've been feeling very guilty about not being able to do that because mm -hmm. I've been so ill and then eventually I remember going into Janine and saying you know am I am I am I manic is this sort of you know I feel I feel quite quite good and she said no you've just forgotten what it feels like to feel normal you know this mm -hmm. is this is this is you this is this is usual and I was like oh I think I'd forgotten when things did resolve, were there any lingering symptoms for you that you still, that you live with for some period mm. of time or you might still live with now? Yes, definitely. So I, um, I got immeasurably better and it was wonderful. As I mentioned, fatigue was one of the ones that was hard to kick and it became, it, it, it became a delicate dance of exactly, is this normal? Because you, lo you lose sense of what is in fact normal. And in any case, your normal's changed because now you have kids. Yes. So you have to figure it out a little bit. Um, and I found that being tired continuously was one of the things that got to me. Um, and so that was adjusted through meds. We had some that were a little more stimulating and that worked well. Again, they take do take time to bed in. I would like to emphasize that because it's, I don't think it's something people necessarily um, are aware of when starting antidepressants but there is and, and if you're not talking to the right people they might not inform you about what to expect. Well, what kind of period of time are you talking about? <sighs> Maggie's probably better placed but I think for me it was they broke it down into here's what you can expect in the first couple of weeks then from you know within the first month then within six weeks and I think by four to six weeks she should be feeling mm -hmm. you know things should have bedded in and you should be able to assess how effective they are. Um, but in the meantime, they're sort of, oh, I feel great because I'm taking a pill. And that could be placebo and then you may feel terrible again and then maybe you get up a bit, but it's not quite so high. And then, you know, and it gradually, and, and I would have days where I'd suddenly be like, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm back to where I was. But because I'd been warned that this was part of the process, you don't suddenly think, oh, well, they're not working and stop taking them. Yeah. You know, you stick with it. 
I can really hear in your story how important it was for you to have guides oh. and people that said to you, I know what this territory looks like. Yes. You know, you're going to be okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it might Just go like this. Out. Yeah, I can map it out. That sounds like that was really important to you That's all right. along and the way. And stop me making decisions that I might have made that would have been detrimental, like mm -hmm. stopping the meds too early, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which in any case wouldn't have been good for me because stopping medication like that, cold turkey, is a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, mm -hmm. it was very helpful to have those people mm -hmm. and, and have Einar there and have him be told that stuff too so that if I forgot, he could remember it yeah. um, and we got through it together. Yeah. So Maggie, I want to ask you, how common is it for people to have lingering symptoms you know, after the initial yes. improvement? Well, well, one thought is if, if a mom doesn't get comprehensive care, she may continue to suffer. If she does, if she gets inadequate care, and then if a mom does get good care, you know there's always the risk of relapse. Mm -hmm. And parenting is hard work; <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> exhausting. So a plan for self-care and monitoring of symptoms is vital. And in my often in my counseling practice, working with new mothers, I would work with a mom for a period of time, weeks or months, and she would find her way, you know, to wellness. Mm -hmm. And then she would often call and come back months or years later and say, I need to check in. You know, I've had some stressful events in my mm -hmm. life, or I've noticed I'm not sleeping again. Maybe I need to go back on my medication, mm -hmm. or just touch base and get some support. Often it was just getting support, but then it was usually easy. Once a mom has been on a healing journey and found what resources really help her, usually it's pretty simple to get back on track. With a little bit of support. With a little bit mm -hmm. of support. You have more self-awareness yes. of what you need, mm -hmm. what your symptoms are, and, and where can, those resources and are. You catch it earlier before it gets yes. too much for you to handle, too. Like, I'm better at recognizing when I need to take care of myself now. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I, when I need sleep or recognizing that I haven't been eating well or, you know, Self-care kind of is everything, and that's the hard part mm. as a new mom, and especially as a mom of twin babies yes. and a husband who's working really hard yes. because he feels a sense of responsibility to yeah. really provide mm -hmm. that part of your story. So making your time for you, mm -hmm. you know, putting your needs in the equation and thinking about what you need and taking time to care for yourself is vital. You know, I think when you and I were first talking about you coming on the show, you said something about that whole metaphor of beating it yes. and, um, and how your relationship to that has changed. Could yes. you say something about what that's been like for you <laughs> yeah, and where sure. are you now with that? Mm. So I think it started when we were talking about the phrase warrior mum, maybe. And I realized I didn't particularly like that phrase. And where, I where did that come from? I think it, it was social media, I think, maybe. People referenced it in the mental health sphere as a way to refer to survivors of postpartum. And I was, I guess it made me feel a little uncomfortable simply because for me, that approach of fighting this thing and denying it and, you know, battling against it was actually the opposite of what I needed to do. It's what I've been trying to do mm -hmm. with, with the anxiety that was what function the anxiety was producing. It was like, if I'm anxious about this and I'm thinking about this, I'm going to solve it and I will do everything I need to do and be perfect. Um, and once I let go of that and realized that I just needed to fall apart and surrender, there was no way around this, I was going to have to just fall to pieces and see what happened. That worked, but it was that surrender that did it. Mm -hmm. and it and then accepting who I was, being very gentle with myself, you know, gently prodding myself to do maybe a little bit here and there, but not not hitting myself over the head with a sense of guilt or shame or responsibility or, well, I must go out for a walk because mm -hmm. otherwise I'm not yeah. going to get well and then I'm not making the effort. No, I yeah. So I know also when we talked initially about you coming on the show, you mentioned that you see yourself as being in a recovery process. Mm -hmm which I think of as sort of an ongoing practice. That's, I love that word recovery because mm -hmm. it really implies that. Yeah. So what are some of the ongoing practices that you've adopted to support yourself? So I take pretty good care of my sleep. I do make sure I have, I think what I was told was like sleep hygiene. That's sort of on point. You know, I don't have light, I don't use my 
when it gets towards the evening, I put my laptop on. I have night mode on my phone, you know, with that yellow light, so it's less likely to keep me up. I then I put my phone down when I go to bed. Sometimes I don't, but most of the time I do. <laughs> put it down to charge and read a book, and that'll send me to sleep. Um, I'm also fairly proactive when it comes to things like taking meds for a headache, whereas I used to just think, oh, I'll just live with it, it'll go away. Now my headaches don't tend to, I'm sure it's like something to do with being older and hormones and whatever, but I'm now, if I sense a headache coming on, I will take a couple of ibuprofen, just to know that I've, you know, done my best with it, and then it, most of the time it will subside. So just little things like that. Um, exercise, even if it's just sort of walking the dog, something like that, um, that's good to do, and I notice when I haven't done it in a while. I also um, do um, artwork. Uh, that was that was a big part of my healing process when I just started to get better, and keeping up with elements of that has been really, really helpful. Um, so I do that as well. Um, and then occasionally going to therapy. That's been really helpful. And just starting to recognize certain aspects of my personality that may make me vulnerable to not feeling so great or certain things I find hard, or stress points in my life that may not be for other people but I find difficult and recognizing those and learning how to preempt that or deal with it. You know, that, I think it's come honestly with getting older too. You realize your own patterns <laughs> of thought. Yeah. You know, yeah. but yeah. Uh, that that's one of the things that postpartum did actually in therapy was sort of help me realize personal ticks that I have. Yeah, you yeah. Know. and motherhood in general, there's almost nothing more that will teach us yeah. a lot about ourselves. Very true. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Well, I really commend you on to, you know what a journey that you've been through and and also your willingness to come and share because I think it is something that many time people are mm. suffering in silence. Yes, definitely. Feeling a lot of shame and um, not coming out, and it's such a common Several experience. Several of my friends, I mean, as soon as I came and went, I've got postpartum and I feel terrible, I think I put it on Facebook. Um, Several of my friends came out and went, oh, yeah, I had that. And I, I was like, well, mm -hmm. you didn't think to say anything, but people don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then suddenly you realize there's this whole network of people who've been through it or, you know, in retrospect had it, all that sort of stuff. So it was really, yeah. That was illuminating. This is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. In case you're just joining us, I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm talking with guest Laura Valsette, who's sharing about how she found her way through postpartum depression and anxiety after giving birth to her twins. We're also joined by psychotherapist and board-certified lactation consultant, Maggie Muir, who's helping us learn more about this condition and where to find help and support. You'll also be hearing from a listener, Brittany, who shares part of her story with us. Every State of Mind show has a resource list, and the resources we talk about today and more can be found on the post for this episode at stateofmindmedia.org. Podcasts of all State of Mind episodes can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and on your home smart speaker. Now, back to our interview. So Maggie, I want to circle back around. I'm going to back up a little bit because I realize there's some questions I wanted to ask you that I didn't sure. get to. Um, you know, we were just talking about how people suffer in silence yes. often, and I'm wondering, what do you see as the barriers to people seeking help? Mm -hmm. There are some barriers that are really sp specific to new motherhood. So one of them is that there, there's, we still have a ways to go with education mm -hmm. and awareness regarding perinatal depression. So sometimes mothers won't recognize early on what it is that they're experiencing. Again, they'll just feel really exhausted, mm -hmm. really anxious, maybe start to have those tapes playing, I'm not a good mom, I'm not cut out for this, without recognizing that this is something that's treatable and that they're slipping into a depression or an anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of the other barriers are childcare, you know, going out and getting help for yourself is hard when you have a baby to take care of. 
um, therapy, you know, there can be the cost of therapy. Um, is this considered a medical condition or a mental health condition that when people seek help, do you know? I think both. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because sometimes the medical coverage on is insurance different. is better yeah. or mm -hmm. different than the mental health. So I was really curious about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know we paid out of pocket for the majority of my treatment. I think my ongoing medication is covered mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, but for the therapy and for seeing Catherine, it was all, yeah, out of pocket. It's expensive. We were just very lucky mm -hmm. that we could afford it. Mm -hmm. You know, frankly, I don't. I spoke to people when I volunteered on the warm line and who have no resources and it's really hard. I mm -hmm. mean, you can't tell them to go and get help when they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to, they need to find free resources, mm -hmm. you know, which is why Postpass and Support International and people like that are helpful. You know, I'm just thinking, Laura, I mean, you've been through quite a journey and I'm wondering, mm -hmm. um, you know, what advice would you offer to other women or possibly even men who are having mm -hmm. a difficult time um, following the arrival of their babies? Yeah. Um, I would say you have nothing to lose by seeking help if you can afford, you know, to, to do it. I was like, well, there's no, there's no point waiting. Don't wait for it to get better. The worst that's going to happen is you're going to go in and someone's going to say, oh, you're fine. Go away. You know, it's fine, totally okay. <laughs> but most of the time, if you get in, if you're slightly worried, just having a conversation about it can help. So I would say do it. If you're slightly worried, have a conversation. Do it early. Um, don't, don't wait until it's embedded itself. Because it can sometimes be hard for partners. You know, every, everyone's personality, I think, changes a little when they have a baby and when a woman... Mm, is in the throes of depression, her partner might then think, well, this is just, this is her. This is her after having a baby. She's just this kind of person. When it, that's not necessarily the case, and Einar luckily recognized that. Um, so yeah, tackling it, tackling it early so that you can label the symptoms as symptoms and start to deal with them, I would say, is one of the major things. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, Maggie, if there was a listener out there who maybe, um, knew someone who might be going through something like this or they themselves, what would you suggest as the very first step? If someone was concerned about a friend. Yeah, or maybe themselves. About themselves. Um, I would, the first step would be to speak up. Speak up and, and, um, and get some help for yourself. So we like to say there's this slogan, speak up if you're feeling down. Mm -hmm. And sometimes enlisting the help, sometimes talking to supportive family and friends can be a great first step, and then they can help you mobilize resources. Um, it's a, a good first step is also to check in with your um, health care provider. Mm -hmm. Often postpartum thyroiditis and anemia can underlie depression and anxiety. So you certainly want to get a physical checkup. Um, Starting to talk with your health care provider can be a great place to start the conversation and get resources. Um, offering yourself um, just compassion and loving kindness and acknowledging that you're doing a really big job. It's mm. a huge job taking care of a baby and that you deserve help and support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned something about um, getting calls on a warm line. Can oh, you? yes. Yes. So um, with Postpartum Support International, I'm sure Maggie can speak to this too. If, you, if anyone is concerned for themselves or for a family member, they can call the warm line, um, which is 1-800-944-4773. Can you say that again really slowly? I can. 1-800-944-4773. <laughs> and what happens is you will call, you'll leave a message giving some details on your name, um, and then we listen to our messages and we go through and we call back. And then we have a chat about how you're feeling. And it's um, mums who, the people who take the call are mums who have been through postpartum depression and who are happy to Great. chat about it. And I've found that in my experience, just having, just having someone to connect with and say, oh yeah, no, that, I've been there, that, that sounds awful. 
you know, was really was really helpful. Mm -hmm. People really s appreciated the support. Okay. And I'd like to add, if I may, that Postpartum Support International is a really well-run organization, and this warm line is a really reliable source mm. of support. So it's Postpartum Support International, and the website is www.postpartum.net. You know, we're going to have to wrap up, but I'm wondering, is there any last things that, you know, come to mind that you would like to be sure that anyone listening to this, maybe this is the first thing they've heard about postpartum depression, that you think would be important for them to know? I would say that it goes away. <laughs> it's quite important when you're in the throes of it. It doesn't feel like it will go away. But just mm -hmm. having someone say, this is, this is temporary, this is not how your life is now as a parent, this will go away. Particularly with proper treatment, it'll go away a lot smoother and a lot faster. Beautiful. Yeah. I always like to tell mothers you're not alone. This mm. is really common. It's the most common complication of childbirth. You're not to blame. Uh, postpartum is a very vulnerable time for a new mother and there are some strong biological underpinnings to postpartum mm -hmm. depression and anxiety. Also in our culture, mothers often don't have the support and help that they need and deserve. And with help, you will be well. Mm -hmm. That's the message that Laura has been offering us. It's a good yeah. message. All perinatal mood disorders are treatable and have the potential to be temporary. So speak up and get some help for yourself. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned earlier, postpartum depression is not always well recognized, as you will hear in this In Your Voice contribution we received from Brittany. I didn't realize how bad my postpartum depression and anxiety was until I was six months postpartum with my third baby. I think deep down I had known that I wasn't okay. But at my six-week visit, my midwife brushed away my concerns about my mood and was focused on telling me that my pelvic floor wasn't strong enough and she couldn't feel my kegels very well. That's the support I left that postpartum visit with. From the time my daughter was born up until that appointment, I'd barely slept more than three hours per night. I experienced three rounds of such bad mastitis, I had fevers of 104 degrees. I had retained placenta, dealt with postpartum hemorrhaging, and a uterine infection. Antibiotics had been prescribed four different times for each infection. At this point, I was so angry at my body for not behaving in the way that I wanted and needed it to. And I did not feel bonded with my daughter. I was sad, angry, and depressed. When I asked for help from my midwife, my legitimate problems were ignored. And I was told about my pelvic floor that I would heal and be fine. I continued to be overwhelmed, was overcome by anxiety. My rage was so bad that it would just bubble out of me towards everyone. My parents, my husband, and worse, my toddler, and even my newborn daughter. I hated myself and was so ashamed that I was not happy and unable to enjoy my new baby. Had I known that I was experiencing telltale signs of postpartum depression and rage, I would have done something to help myself. Instead, I felt alone and ashamed, ashamed that I couldn't help myself and couldn't find happiness. Over the next six months, the depression intensified. I began having panic attacks that made it impossible for me to take care of my children. I pushed my husband away, which brought us to the brink of serious marriage problems. I was unable to change my behavior no matter how hard I tried. After a particularly embarrassing incident, when I had a severe panic attack at Disneyland and the fire department and ambulance was called, I finally said something again to my primary care doctor. 
She took me seriously and offered me medication that I was unable to take since I was still breastfeeding my daughter. I was so tied to breastfeeding her, thinking that I was doing the best for her and that she was more important than taking care of my own needs. When my daughter was 15 months old, I stopped nursing. The medication worked like magic. A black cloud lifted and I began to feel like myself again. Sure, I still had anxiety, but the daily multiple panic attacks vanished. The anger lessened. To this day, I still carry around the guilt and shame and feel like my girls deserved a better mom than I was in those dark days. However, going through what I was experiencing, the truth is I was the best mom I could have been. Though it took a long time, I recognize that now. Thank you, Brittany. For those seeking support in the Santa Cruz area, a wonderful option is the free virtual postpartum wellness support group for moms with their babies up to one year old, which meets online on Monday mornings and is led by Sutter Lactation staff and experienced therapists. The group provides emotional support, tools for calming your nervous system, education, advice, and resources to promote wellness in the postpartum period. If you're listening from other areas of the country, you may want to check out the 14 virtual specialty support groups offered through Postpartum Support International with groups for moms, dads, queer and trans parents, and parents of one to four year olds. More information can be found in the show notes on the State of Mind page on the KSQD website. I want to say a huge thank you to our guests, Laura Balsett and Maggie Muir, and to Brittany for contributing her In Your Voice story for today's show. And thanks to you for joining us here on State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. New episodes exploring mental health and wellness are released the first Sunday of every month and can be found along with our complete archive on our website, stateofmindmedia.org. Also, if you found today's show interesting and you'd like to learn more or are looking for resources for yourself or a loved one, check out the resource list posted there with this episode. You can also listen to any episode or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or listen through your home smart speaker. When you rate and review our podcast, you're helping State of Mind get found and heard by more listeners. So please, would you do that for us? Special thanks to Jeannie Baldzikowski for audio production, to Leslie Nielsen for community outreach, and to Lisa Herendine for research. And thanks to acoustic guitarist Adrian Legg for composing, performing, and donating the use of our theme music. State of Mind was developed and originally broadcast in association with KSQD-FM in Santa Cruz, California. Come on back and join us again next month for a whole new episode of State of Mind. Until then, live well. Mm -hmm.